gives me great pleasure to bring on board Chris Woods of Jeffrey, someone who I've interacted with uh, for nearly two decades now. He's been a long India bull, someone who's been very vocal about why he's always maintained a overweight position on India. And guess what? His latest report talks about a magical number, which is absolutely music to everyone's here. Because Chris Wood now is making a case that Indian markets, which is benchmark index sensex, could be one lakh. I count the number of zeros. Could be one lakh very soon. Chris, what a delight to have you on ET now. Thank you for joining us. You know, uh, our viewers and me, we always look forward to your thoughts on India. Uh, and especially at a time when we know that the world is going through a very serious adjustment, at least on the risk side. Chris, let me start with the move point. By now, you must have digested the budget. What do you make of it? Well, to me, this is, again, a pro-growth budget, which uh, I think the key takeaway is, is a, it's, a, it's more of the same of what we saw last year, where the government seems to be focusing on driving infrastructure capex. So to me, because the, the deficit <coughs> spending is going into investment, I'm, you know, I'm relaxed on the fiscal deficit and I, I view it as a pro-growth budget. But Chris, while we can talk about growth, growth is coming at a time when if you try and generate growth in a world where supply disruptions and logistics issues are large, could that stroke inflation? Inflation coming back into India, it really could just backfire all the, you know, the, it could just backfire. No, I'm not, I'm not bothered about the speaking of inflation in India. The inflation issue we have right now in world markets is primarily uh, the inflation issue is primarily centered on the G7 economies, uh, most particularly America. It reflects the huge monetary and fiscal stimulus implemented in the US, UK, Eurozone in response to the pandemic. Demand was artificially stimulated because people were paid money to do nothing. In Asia, uh, governments have not paid lots of money to people to do nothing be that China, be it India, or be it Southeast Asia. As a result, we haven't had demand artificially stimulated, so the inflationary pressures are much less. Chris, we've seen intense selling in US uh, technology stocks, excepting uh, Apple and Alphabet and Microsoft. Everything has come tumbling down. Meta was down 25% last week. Netflix has got spooked. What do you make of this selling? Uh, well, I think we've commenced a relief rally. Um, it's only behind us, in my view, if the Fed does another U-turn. But if the Fed proceeds with its stated policy of, mean, of seeking to tighten monetary policy to combat inflation, so long as the Fed is signaling that, these stocks will remain at risk. We have seen in the last two months the most dramatic U-turn by a central bank I have ever witnessed. I call it the Jekyll and Hyde Fed. Back in late September, more than half the Fed governors said no rate hike at all in 2022. In the last two months, we've had Fed governors competing to sound more hawkish. And we've had sell side economists doing the same. So we're now looking at three, four rate hikes at least. But I think also very important for the markets is the Fed is discussing balance sheet contraction or so-called quantitative tightening. And there's concerns in the market that the Fed may start contracting the balance sheet at the same time they do rate hikes. That's far from guaranteed, but if they did, that would lead to more market nervousness. This entire debate on how much of the Fed move of 2022 is in the price. Is it three, is it four, or is it more? The pricing in three or four rate hikes, but I think the key, the very important variable, which is not completely priced in because the Fed has not clarified what its policy is, relates to the balance sheet. In my view, markets are more nervous about balance sheet contraction than rate hikes. By the way, the Fed balance sheet will be nearly nine trillion dollars when they complete um, their asset purchases at the end of March. I believe when the pandemic began, it, the Fed balance sheet was six trillion. But can Fed really go aggressive on the rate hike? Because if interest rates they go higher, Fed will have a bigger problem because they will have to with the, uh, deal with the cost of rising debt. 
No, that's true. But we have to ask ourselves, why has the Fed done this astonishing uh, U-turn? The, there's two reasons, in my view. One reason is they simply got it wrong. So they had a new strategic, they, had, they completed a strategic review in 2020. <clears throat> that strategic review gave them the room to, the license to overshoot their 2% target. They maintained the view that it was the inflation pickup was transitory all last year until we had the CPI report coming up at about 7%. And that prompted Fed Chairman Powell to do his reversal on saying it's not transitory. So I think the Fed was forced to do that because if inflation is coming out five percentage points above your target, if you don't uh, admit it's, you're wrong, you, you begin to become it's bordering on self-caricature because obviously five percentage points is a big miss. But there's another reason why the Fed has uh, started to... Uh, focused on inflation, and that is political pressure from the Biden administration. For the first time since the 70s, we have political pressure on the Fed to tighten because the Biden administration is polling very badly on the economy and inflation, and they are perceived to have lost control of inflation, and that's a big negative for, with the midterm elections coming up. So there's a political need on the part of the Biden administration for the Fed to be seen to be doing something about inflation. So yeah. this political pressure is there, and that is something we haven't seen literally in decades. Chris, we understand that the Prime Minister has written a personal letter to you and uh, this, in a sense, is an endorsement from uh, the Prime Minister and, and his office, the fact that you've been a long-term India bull and some a call which is now just getting recognized and is now getting rewarded. Yes, so that's, that's true, Nick. I'm very, I'm very honored to have received this letter. And um, yes, I, I definitely remain uh, constructive on the Indian story. And I believe a lot of important reforms have been implemented during the term of the during the term of the current government, current prime minister. And I think we are set. I'm hoping India is set up for an extended investment cycle, similar to what we saw between 2002, three to 2009. And so I continue to draw comfort from the um, the, the, the evidence that the housing cycle picked up in a, to a significant degree last year after a seven-year downturn. So I'm hoping or I'm assuming that recovery continues this year, even if we get some rate hikes by the RBI, which is likely. And I'm hoping, as are my colleagues in Jeffrey's Indian office, to the um, residential property cycle will be followed with a lag by a broader CapEx cycle. And the government, by doing all this uh, capex in infrastructure, is definitely creating an environment which should make the private sector more willing to invest. Chris, uh, in the second half of 2021, your view was that Indian markets were trading at a premium to Chinese markets and Chinese markets had fallen a lot in 2021 because of regulatory issues. Now that China is... Uh, easing interest rates so while India was going to be increasing interest rates. Is there a case for global investors whom you consult and whom you advise that one is better off putting money into China? And if that is the case where global investors, in a sense, uh, start putting uh, or start uh, going back to China, what do, you, what do you think that will mean for a market like India? Because there is evidence of that, Chris, already. December was a month of outflows, January was a month of outflows, and Feb so far has been very volatile on FI flows front. Well, no, I'm, I'm staying, I have not reduced my weighting in India, but yes, you're absolutely right, Sanakun, that what I said in the greed and fear is that um, in the short term, India is vulnerable <coughs> because it's, one, it's done very well, two, it's expensive, and three, we have this external, uh, we now have this external Fed tightening risk. So I'm not surprised to see India correct. And we've had actually quite significant selling of Indian equities by foreign investors, I believe, in um, <clears throat> the first few weeks of this year. 
<laughs> None of that surprises, but what is very encouraging is that in inflows into Indian domestic mutual funds remain strong. And in my view, um, corrections in India are buying opportunities, be those corrections triggered by concerns about the Fed or concerns about RBI tightening. I think the Indian market can be resilient in the face of uh, rate hikes, just as it was back in 2003, 4, 5, 6. However, this year, China is easing policy. Last year, China was tightening. So it definitely makes sense for equity investors to increase their exposure to China. But you, the two are not mutually exclusive. So do you see India or Indian business cycle moving independently of what is happening in the world, Chris? You know, I think India is a domestic demand story and corrections caused by externalities are just buying opportunities. So the two big, apart from the obvious risk of a new, more damaging COVID variant, which will hit all markets, including India, the two big external risks for India, which will create, which can definitely create sell-offs, which create opportunities for investors in India to buy more equities, are one, Fed tightening, because as I said, the inflation problems in America is not in India. And the second one is uh, the oil price. That is, a, that is a real risk. Oil's already gone up a lot. I've been telling investors to own oil stocks all last year and this year. I believe there's a real risk that oil can go significantly higher uh, because of the, uh, the artificial situation which has been created by the, uh, the environmental attack on fossil fuels has had the paradoxical impact of raising the cost of energy because the attack on fossil fuels has discouraged corporates from investing in oil, but the world still consumes oil. So we, uh, we have a real loom growing supply constraints. And what's interesting is the oil price has already gone up a lot today and a lot of Asia, including China, remains closed. So that means if China opens, which is not my base case, but let's say I'm wrong and China opens this year, oil can go significantly higher. So my message is to own oil stocks to hedge this risk. Chris, Indian markets have historically done very well when the first rate cycle starts because it is considered to be pro-growth and not so much so pro-inflation. Do you think the same uh, factor will be at play that while we can argue about the implications of cost of credit going higher, in the short to medium term it is something which markets are likely to endorse rather than running away from it? Yes, 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 I do believe that. Most particularly domestically, the only risk is this: these externalities from Wall Street. <coughs> but fundamentally, so long as we have evidence that the investment cycle is picking up, I, I, I definitely believe that. Now, the other interesting point is I'm hoping that this time around, let's say oil goes to $120, just to pick up a number out of my head. I'm hoping that this time India will be less hit by higher oil than before because we have much higher foreign exchange reserves in India than in the past. Chris, while cyclicals, industrial, financials, they are a play on mean reversion, which is for the benefit of our viewers. If I'm extend this point, economy will come back and these stocks will come back from uh, the underperformance they've had. But what about IT? IT is in a linear trend. Stocks are at an all time high. There is a rupee tailwind, there is a business tailwind, and there is a headwind of wage inflation. What is your view on IT? Uh, after the recent run-up right now these, these these are dramatic obviously these companies have been dramatically successful the fangs have been phenomenal places to invest for the last many years although the fangs market shares percentage of s p peaked out in the summer of 2020 and in my view as as, as registered an all-term peak so in my view so long as these inflationary these these higher inflation pressures are visible um, global investors, investors in the U.S. need to own, you know, they need to have a big weighting in cyclical stocks. You can no longer just own um, growth stocks, tech stocks, which is what you could do for the last 10 years. So the best performing sector in the S&P last year was the energy sector, not the fangs. 
And the best performing sector year to date in the S&P when I last checked is again the energy sector. So Chris, this entire move from growth versus value and a mean reversion in value, is that a multi-year decadal trend where you will see value stocks outperforming? Well, that's a very good question. If inflation remains structurally higher after the pandemic, which is my base case, maybe if I had to pick a number out of my head, let's say inflation settles in the 3-4% range, that is that definitely means that cyclical stocks should be become a more stable part of the portfolio. However, growth stocks will get another bid if it turns out that the Fed will not ultimately be as hawkish as what markets are now worrying about. So in my view, the uh, it would be quite likely at some point this year we see another U-turn by the Fed as big as the one we've just witnessed in the last two months. Because the American economy can't really deal with very with significant monetary tightening because of the high levels of debt. The same applies to the European economy. So what is the middle path then, Chris? Where do you see things really settling uh, on inflation and again on growth front? Rates have to go higher. There is no argument on that. But it, it cannot go up endlessly. Similarly, Growth is here and growth is real. Even high interest rates will not puncture growth completely. Well, no, basically, if the Fed is going to meaningfully tighten, the Fed needs to, to get, um, reimpose real interest rates. We are looking at the most negative interest rates in America since the 1950s. <coughs> so, <coughs> but the question is, is the Fed really going to do that? But let's say the Fed raises rates four times this year. <clears throat> you know, the re the, we still have a significantly negative real federal funds rate. Chris, a direct and a straightforward question: Has Fed lo lost its credibility? Do you think now they will be much more aggressive in order to keep their nose ahead of inflation? Yeah, no, I agree with you. That's why, in the short term, <clears throat> I would advise investors to sell rallies in growth stocks. We've seen a shakeout in crypto. We've seen built off a reversal in some of the so-called US tech stocks, NFT valuations which had gurus, which had gone crazy are now coming back. Do you think somewhere there could be a risk off moment if there is a further meltdown, let's say in crypto or US tech stocks? Because the world is very leveraged, Chris, because of the low interest rates. There's a lot of leverage across the board now. No, yeah, well, there's been a lot of leverage in, uh, in the crypto markets. So I think the crypto asset class remains a very interesting long-term story, but so but so does so do a lot of these uh, biotech stocks and other um, other other areas of, of 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 technology, all of which have been performing very well until the last three months. But I would have to say all these forms of investments remain vulnerable to renewed selling pressure so long as the Fed is tightening and there's concerns on balance sheet contraction. So I'm not surprised to see uh, what I call profitless uh, tech stocks get hit badly. So the components of the famous ARK ETF are the classic example. I'm not surprised to see biotech stocks gets get smashed, which they have been. And I'm not surprised to see the crypto asset class get smashed. So for people with the holding power, this is a this is a long term opportunity. But so long as people are worrying about Fed tightening rate hikes, balance sheet contraction, um, your what well, well, the base case should be that these, these areas will remain vulnerable.